God said through his prophet Isaiah, in the beginning of the book of Isaiah, instructing the Israelites to cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and lastly, to plead the widow's cause. This evening we want to talk on the subject, of course, of justice. The animal kingdom uh, is an unjust, vulgar world. There is a, a, a poet who went out in the middle of a forest to live in Virginia. And she wrote a book called uh, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. And she thought that she would go there in just immerse herself in nature and she would be inspired and she would see in nature the beauty and the harmony of God's creation. And uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting read because she found, she, there's a, a harmony there, but it is a vicious, vicious world. A praying mantis, YouTube this when you get home has intercourse, and then the female eats the head of the male when it's done. Do you guys know this? You can watch the video. It's, it's, it's terrible. A, a panda, a panda bear. If a panda has twins, it just takes one and throws it out and allows it to starve to care for the one. Now we look at that, and if, if humans did any of, of this, this would be wrong. This would be unfair. This would be unjust. My point is that justice is unique to human beings. And we develop a sense of justice very, very early. My children have a very acute sense of justice. That's not fair as they're yanking on this one thing and they have to have it. Their idea of justice might be skewed, but they, it's there. And then they go to mom and dad for judgment. The reason that human beings are, are different is because God made us different. He set apart human beings from all the other creatures. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our own image. And in the image of God, he created them male and female. Humanity, male and female, is made up of the image of God. We are meant to be mirror images of our creator. We are meant to reflect God in some way. And he, he takes Adam and Eve, the very first human beings, and he sets them over his creation, and he essentially tells them to rule, to be like a, a king and a queen, to rule over the birds of, of, of the air and, and the fish in the sea and the beasts that roam on the earth. And as they are supposed to rule as image bearers of God. In other words, they're supposed to rule like God would rule. And the psalmist says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, of God's throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. This is the kind of rule. This is how they're supposed to lead their families and how when the communities are formed, they're supposed to treat each other. And it all goes back to this idea that we're created in the image of God. And all people are created equal. And every human being, no matter who you are, you're created in the image of God, therefore you deserve to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. But historically, we have utterly failed. Human beings simply don't practice justice. What we do is we redefine good and evil. We redefine right and wrong in our own favor at the expense of other people. And the weaker a person is, well, the easier they are to take advantage of. 
In, in biblical history, we see this throughout the Bible. It happens on a personal level. It happens on, on the family level where a parent will, will choose one of their children and, and, and give them more attention and more love than the rest of them. It happens in, in whole communities. It happens in whole civilizations. Civilizations that, that create injustice with, with policies, with practices that take advantage of the vulnerable and weak part of the population. We live in an unjust world. And that's not how God intended it. But out of this messy world, if you fast forward through Genesis a few chapters, God chooses one man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. He's going to work through this man and his seed and his progeny. And he says of Abraham in Genesis 18, For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. How do you keep the way of the Lord? God says, by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised to him. We do God's will by doing righteousness, by doing justice. And out of this family of Abraham comes an entire nation, the nation of Israel. And God commands them. He gives them a law at Mount Sinai. And this law is meant to inspire them and move them as they follow these commandments toward these ideas of justice and equity and fairness and righteousness. And they're supposed to be this beacon to the world so that when other people, Deuteronomy 4, see God's image in this whole nation, that they would glorify God. Wow, what an amazing God this is that they serve. Look at how they're treating one another. God's people are set apart from the world to be righteous. Well, what do these words mean? Righteous, the Hebrew word, has to do with relationships between people. This is the idea that you're going to treat people as they are, image bearers of God, with God-given dignity, the dignity and the fairness that they deserve. And so righteousness is the standard of right relationships. Justice, the Hebrew word mishpat, are the actions that we do to follow this standard of righteousness, God's standard of right and wrong. Now, justice can take two forms. That could be re retributive justice. You know, when someone steals, he has violated the standard of righteousness. And therefore, justice has to be done. That means he needs to be punished because he has violated what is right. But more often, in the Old Testament, when we read about this term mishpat, justice, it's not retributive, it's not punishment, it's restorative justice, which is a whole nother layer of meaning. It's a deeper kind of justice. It's going a step further. What restorative justice, restorative mishpat, is actually seeking out the vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. It's about being an advocate for people who are oppressed. A couple of examples of this. Job in chapter 29. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Job chapter 29. Job is a tremendous example of one who did righteousness and justice. Job 29. We're going to begin reading in verse 11. Now Job is reminiscing about his, his standing in society before his life was turned upside down. And so Job is thinking back and he says in verse 11, For when the ear heard, it called me blessed. When the eye saw, it gave witness of me. Because I delivered the poor who cried for help, and the orphan who had no helper. The blessing of the one ready to perish came upon me, and I made the widow's heart sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. And I investigated the case which I did not know. I broke the jaws of the wicked and snatched the prey from his teeth. 
Job was an outstanding example of what we're talking about today. He made sure everyone in his community received fair treatment. Another ex example is how the Israelites were to treat the Levites. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18 now. Deuteronomy chapter 18. And just the first couple verses there. Now, the tribe of the Levites, they, unlike the other tribes of Israel, the other tribes of Israel, they have these, these portions of land that God gave them as an inheritance. So the tribe of Benjamin would be here, and the tribe of Judah would be here, and these are the boundaries and all that. And that was their land. Well, the tribe of Levi didn't inherit land uh, so, because they had a special job. They were to serve in, in the temple. So the Levites actually received a kind of a, a tax from the other tribes. Look at what is said in the first couple of verses here of uh, Deuteronomy 18. The Levitical priests, the whole tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's offerings by fire and his portion. They shall have no inheritance among their countrymen. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. Now this shall be the priest's due. In other words, these are his rights. This is his mishpat. This is, is, is the priest's justice from the people. From those who offer a sacrifice, either an ox, a sheep, uh, of which they shall give uh, to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. So they were supposed to get a portion of this food. That was a kind of tax. That was their right. That was their mishpat. That was their justice. Turn to the prophet Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah. This might be in the place in your Bible where the pages are all stuck together. Just like Michael read from Nahum today. Nobody got there quick enough for that one. We'll give you, we'll give you a moment here to, to get to Zechariah. Chapter 7. I'm needing more than a moment. Chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7. The, the, the widow among God's people, the orphan, the immigrant, the poor. These people made up this very vulnerable layer of Israelite society. They had unique mishpat. They had unique rights. Look at what the prophet says in chapter 7 in verse 9. Thus has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother, and do not oppress the widow or the orphan the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And so they were told to, to make sure that these people in their communities were, were taken care of. Justice and righteousness. These were the calling cards of the Israelite people. This is what made them stand out among the nations and call their Lord, Yahweh, blessed. Look at this. This people is distinct. They don't behave like the Canaanites. They don't behave like the Moabites. They're radically selfless and, and sacrificial because they're advocating for people who can't speak for themselves. And these ideas are just woven throughout all aspects of the Scripture. If you look in the wisdom literature, in the book of Proverbs, you see this same thing. At the end of the book of Proverbs, Look in chapter 31, Proverbs 31 and verses 8 and 9. The words of this King Lemuel, he says in verse 8, Open your mouth for the mute, those people who can't speak, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. We see this idea as pervasive not only in the wisdom literature, but in, in the prophets. We read one in Zechariah. I'll give you another example in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 22, and verse 3. Jeremiah in chapter 22. Here, if you remember our study in Jeremiah, uh, he's about to launch into a uh, history of their kings. And Jeremiah says in verse 3 of chapter Two, he gives an example of what, how the kings were supposed to rule in Israel. You already know the answer. Do justice and righteousness and deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor. Also, do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan, or the widow. Do not shed innocent blood in this place. 
We see it there in the Psalms as well. Turn over to Psalm uh, 146, near the end of the book of Psalm. Turn back to Psalm 146. Psalm 146, starting in verse 7. The Bible says, talking about God here, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow, but He thwarts the way of the wicked. God ruins the way of the wicked. The wicked the, the word rasha means the guilty, those people who are in the wrong. This is the kind of person who is not doing justice, who is not doing righteousness. He's mistreating his neighbor. He's ignoring his dignity as an image bearer of God. Bruce, Bruce Waltke, a commentator, said this on the subject of justice. He says, The righteous are those who are willing to disadvantage themselves to the advantage of their community. The wicked are those who are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. And God is very serious, very serious about this, about the rights among His people, and about justice and righteousness. It's what Israel is supposed to be all about. Now the descendants of Abraham... They became a great nation, just like God said. And they ended up, just like God said, in Egypt. And while they were down there in Egypt, they spent 400 years being slaves of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was so wicked. He was very Rasha. He was not doing justice. He was not doing righteousness. He oppressed God's people. God heard the, the cry of His people, and He acts. When there's injustice, God acts. He confronts Egypt's wickedness. And he declares them guilty. They're guilty of injustice. And he rescues the people of Israel. Exodus chapter 5 basically says that he's going to, to take them out from under the burden of Pharaoh, under the burden of Egypt. And with a strong arm, with mighty acts of justice, of mishpat, he's going to deliver uh, Israel. And Israel was supposed to remember where they came from. They were supposed to mem remember how they were mistreated, how they were being oppressed. In fact, this is part of their law. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter um, 24, Deuteronomy 24, and verse 17. <clears throat> After God saves this people and He gives them this law, this is part of the law. He says in verse 17, you shall not pervert the justice do an alien or an orphan, nor take a widow's garment and pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I'm commanding you to do this thing. In other words, remember what it was like. Don't, don't be Pharaoh. Don't treat people the same way Pharaoh treated you. And there's the great irony of the people of Israel. You fast forward, it doesn't take very long. And the irony is that these redeemed people, the, the, the oppressed, they went on to commit the very same acts of injustice against their own vulnerable people. They became just like Pharaoh, just as corrupt, just as wicked. And so, God sent His prophets to declare Israel guilty. His very own people, He declared guilty. You can read about it in any book of the prophets, but I just picked out one in Amos chapter 5 in your own time. But injustice isn't just something in the ancient world. For goodness sakes, just open your eyes. It's rampant. It's everywhere. There are some people who actively perpetrate injustice to benefit themselves so that they receive special privileges. And they, they, they have chips in the game that the, the way the structure is set up remains the way it is so that they can receive the benefits, so that they can remain on top, so that they can have all the power. And sadly, history shows that when the oppressed people, when they rise above and they gain power, they become 
the next generation of oppressors themselves. And so we're all part of the problem. All of humanity, whether we're actively participating in this, we're, we're passively, we're, we're just unintentionally, we're all part of the problem. And so you'd think, looking back at, at Israel, looking back at you know, places like Babylon and Sodom and Gomorrah and, and wicked places like Egypt, you would think that God would respond with this retributive justice, this punishment every single time. It would be like the Exodus on loop. Well, now you've, you've you know, the, the oppressed become the oppressors, so we'll destroy them again. We'll, we'll just continue this endless loop of judgment. But that is the surprising message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, God's response to our legacy of injustice is to intervene by giving us a gift. And it's the gift of the life of His Son. Look what... Peter says about this in 1 Peter chapter 3. Just a very short statement that sums up God's response to the wickedness, to the injustice of humanity. 1 Peter 3 verse 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And this is what Grant was talking about this morning surrounding the Lord's table and what Michael brought up again this evening. That in the cross of Jesus Christ, God's love and mercy and grace for humanity, it, it unites and it, and, it, and it combines with His just and righteous character. And He remains just by taking the punishment, by taking the judgment that we, the guilty, deserve upon Himself in one act of self-sacrifice so that He can be the just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. Romans 3 and verse 26. That's what makes the gospel such good news. Jesus' life is a gift given to guilty people so that the guilty can be forgiven, they can be, de be declared righteous before God, not because of anything that they have done, but because of what Jesus has done for them. And you see, this is how Jesus comes on the scene. He's aware of human history. He's been watching it. He's been watching it go down the toilet bowl. And so He singles out a certain layer of of Israelite culture. He comes to preach the gospel to the poor, to bring good news to the poor. God has sent him to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is what God's Spirit endowed him to do. And the poor the poor in any community, the poor in Danville, the poor wherever you might happen to be, they're often the first group of people to receive, not to comprehend the gospel, and to receive it and make it their own. Because they're usually the ones being taken advantage of. They're the victims of injustice. And this was the focus of Jesus' ministry. These are the kind of people that He went after. And these are the kind of people that, as we've noticed in the Gospel of Luke, that are responding positively to the Gospel. He, he moves towards the widows. He's moving toward the leper. He's moving even toward the Gentile. He's moving toward those who have fallen through the cracks of society, the outsiders. And He's restoring them to a right relationship with God by forgiving them of their sins and calling upon them to repent. We see this in Luke chapter 14. When Jesus gives a parable of a master who is giving a great banquet, he's throwing at this, this great party and he wants everyone to be there and there's going to be food and he, he sends out his messenger to go to these people and everyone's got all these excuses. And nobody, nobody wants to show up. Nobody's interested in it because they're too busy with their own lives. And so the master tells him, tells a servant, you go out to the boondocks. You go out to the alleyways. You go out to the gutters of society, so to speak, and you call the poor, and you call the blind, and you call the lame and the crippled, and you send for them, and, you, and those are the people who come and respond. And sure enough, there's even more room to spare. This is the way it's been. 
These are the people who respond to the gospel. And if when you become a disciple, you're not just declared righteous by God, you are declared righteous when you obey the gospel, but rather God's righteousness changes your life and it compels you to act in a surprising way, in a way that you wouldn't before. Think about it. If God declares me righteous after all that I've done against Him and against people uh, made in His image, when I didn't deserve it because of something that God has done for me, the only reasonable response is to go out and seek righteousness and justice for other people. This is the essence of true religion. This is what James is saying to us as Christians in James 1.27. Religion that is pure, religion that is undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And visit doesn't mean just stopping by once in a while, taking care of them, seeing to their needs, seeing that their needs are met, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You guys get the hint. I've been saying the same thing for 25 minutes. It's about making other people's problems my problems. It's about bearing one another's burdens. It's about advocating for the vulnerable. It's about making sure nobody falls through the cracks. So no one's being pushed down so someone else can rise up. It's about rising together and holding each other's hands. It's about loving your neighbor as yourself. What James is doing, essentially, is he is echoing the words of Micah in the Old Testament. Micah came on the scene as God's prophet and he exposed Israel. How these wealthy landowners were corrupt and how they were unjust. They were running the economy. They were running the show. They were guilty in chapter 2 of buying land from these poor landowners by bullying them. They were changing the boundary lines in their favor so that they could have a greater portion. They were guilty of bribing local judges and bribing prophets and rigging weights and measures in their favor. And so God says through His prophet what He's been saying all along, what, he, what he, His intention for humanity since Genesis chapter 1. He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And so we come to the end of our lesson, simply putting the ball in your court. Are you going to be a person who does righteousness? Who does justice? Are you going to speak for those who have no voice? Are you going to take up the cause of the powerless? Now, I'm not necessarily being political. I'm talking about operating, you know, you might not have the power or the influence, quite frankly, none of you do, <laughs> to change, you know, policy in America. That's not what we're after. America is always going to be a mess. You know, the world is always going to be a mess. We're always going to be, you know, making improvements. But at least in this community, where you have influence, the world where you live, you can make a difference. And if the cross means something to us, then we've got to use whatever influence we've got to motivate change for justice. We've got to do justice ourselves, do righteousness ourselves, and that means making other people's problems my own. Some of you guys are going to go to school tomorrow morning. You're going to wake up early. That's your world. That's your world of influence. When there's bullying at school, when you see some big kid picking on a little kid, when you see disruption in the classroom and disrespect in the classroom, guess what God doesn't want you to do? Pull out your phone and tape it and put it online. That is not doing justice. That is not doing righteousness. What God wants you to do is get in the middle of the fight and break it up. And that might mean you might get punched in the face. So be it, the just for the unjust. Do righteousness. Do justice. And that's going to make a lasting impact on people. When there's justice at the workplace, God doesn't want us to sit in our cubicle and, and fester with discontent and gossip behind people's back when there's something wrong. He teaches us to stand on our convictions, to do what's right, to speak out and act out against it. And if you're seeing injustice in the workplace, if you're seeing somebody stealing, even if they're in a higher position than you, and they're being dishonest, do justice. 
Do righteousness. And you say, well, I might lose my job. So be it. God will take care of those who do justice and righteousness. God forbid. God forbid there be any injustice in God's family, in His community, in the new Israel. Sadly, I think sometimes we preach, but we don't practice justice as our Lord did. And shame on us. Shame on us who vocalize our strong convictions against such things as instrumental music. Rightly so. We need to be vocalizing that. But not while remaining silent where injustice is done to a brother or sister in Christ. And if that's the case, then Jesus has a word for us. And it's the same word that He gave to the Pharisees. Woe to you! Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Let's make sure we are worshiping according to the pattern that we find in the New Testament. But let's make sure that we are treating each other with equity and fairness doing justice and righteousness. Let's be known in this community for people who stand on our convictions, not just speaking out against it, but stepping in the middle of it. That's the way we show the world who Jesus is. Actions will always speak louder than words, and so let's not be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. For hearers of the word only, and we come to service faithfully every Sunday, we're deceiving ourselves. So the world doesn't need... The world doesn't need any more virtue signaling on Facebook. The world doesn't need another article about what's wrong in the world. The world doesn't need more talk and online tirades against oppression and inequality. What the world needs is one person showing and living the gospel to another person. One person doing tzedakah, doing mishpat, doing righteousness, doing justice. Real people doing the right thing. Close your Bibles and open to the song that's been selected here. Song number 347. Song number 347. All of humanity has contributed to injustice. Paul says in no uncertain terms in the book of Romans, none is righteous. No, not even one. But later on, Paul would write, and yet, for our sake, he made him, God made Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you need to be made righteous, that is what God is offering you through the gift of His Son, not because of anything that you've done, but because of His initiative and His love for you. Sarah has done something very courageous today. She has made a, a step into a new world to give her life over to her Lord and her Savior, to be a person of justice and righteousness and follow in His footsteps. And we're simply asking, do you have the same courage that, that she showed? And if you haven't been baptized, I want you to think about that. And now's the time to do it as we stand and sing. <laughs>